My name's Jody, and I am a good friend of Juniper from years ago as a singing friend. Very true, lots of good memories. Mm -hmm. And today we're discussing your personal experience, your personal story throughout 2020 and the COVID pandemic. Where would you like to start? Well, probably starting right when it started. So unexpected at a, at a time of my, mu I'm a musician and a conductor and uh, um, I plan musical events and I rehearse children and I re rehearse women and I rehearse men and women and I put, bring people up and do concerts like that. And that's been my life. I'm 68 um, and I went to graduate school for it when I was 25. I did it all during college. I can't remember a time when I haven't done this and it's sometimes a nightmare I have is what would I, what do I do? And then I think I do music. And then I realize I do do something. It's, it's just about, you know, it's, it's my passion. So anyway, last, last March, we had a concert in our home with a cellist in early March. And then we were planning to go off to Florida for a few nights and then be with our son, who's in his mid thirties, having a, a, some colon reattachment surgery in New York. That's when the pandemic really hit, right when we were there. And rather than go in, the surgery was successful, but we were there watching. And I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else, but to be right in New York City when suddenly things were changing. It was easy to get a cab, nobody wore masks. Um, mostly, a lot of Asian people wore masks because they have been doing that for a long time anyway. But there were no masks, but there were lots of easy cabs. Restaurants weren't full. We were staying at a beautiful place. Hardly anyone was there. Um, and then we were, um, went to the last Broadway show, day of Broadway before it closed down to see a, a dear young friend of, former student of mine perform in a show and went to the hospital. We were able to get in the first day, the second day, only one of us could. And by the third day, no one was allowed in. And what so were you we were feeling then? How was I feeling? That, that third day when no one was allowed in, did, what did that feel uh, like? Like a, like a movie, like a dis, sort of dystopian in a way. Um, kind of, in, I was in denial, but I, I knew things were coming and that we needed to just um, be support. We were there to support my son's wife. Couldn't help him much, but it helped him a lot to know that she had had really people who were going through it together. And it, yes. the surgery ended up being very working just well enough so that they're having, they just had a baby last week. So Congratulations. That was, that's how, how well the surgery went. <laughs> As we say, all of his tubes were working by the time that was over. So we're, we're delighted about that. But then I went home to a, to a whole different world and it was as if um, somebody had said, you've always talked about wanting a sabbatical, Jody, but here it is, mm. you've got it now. And it was very unplanned. Talk and to me more about that. What was the toughest part of facing that? What did that feel like? Well, first it was, it was like getting out of a lot of work because it, I hadn't planned it, but I had a, a, a busy spring planned with a, with a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta with kids and a bunch of stuff with women and several um, guest artists coming. And suddenly we just had to stop. And that was like, whoa, how awesome is this? Um, I can do, I have some free time. I'm not pressured. I, I really actually felt just fine about it. And then other kids who live in Brooklyn, New York, announced that they needed to come and stay because it was they needed help with the kids. They have one and a three-year-old. And that was fun. We were so they made the trek from New York to New Hampshire, where you live. Mm -hmm. They did. And so we the, the beginning part of it, I thought, was actually kind of novel. And I was, I didn't think of it like a sabbatical. I thought of it like a snow day, a long series of snow days. <laughs> um, and and I, I really didn't 
mine and I didn't worry. And I, I knew that I'd be off to Montana with our oldest granddaughter at the end of June for the long awaited Grammy Joe and, mm -hmm. and Molly trip and everything was gonna be fine. And I got out of having to work in the spring and still was getting paid. So how good is this? And we paid all our artists that didn't work and we were, the board was awesome. And we went through that whole period. And, and then as it dawned on me that we weren't gonna be able to do any music in the fall, mm. then I was sort of left in a, in a state of, um, I felt a little unanchored, let's say, yes. let's set adrift. Yes. And there we what, was there anything you found that gave you comfort in that time, that feeling of being adrift and unanchored from something that was so important in your life? Well, the family living at our house made it, it certainly made it, um, they were busy. They, this is the whole, they were, my son works for the Washington Post and he was, he's right now in the next room. He's been, mm -hmm. he's still here. Um, and he's working hard. He's in the business side of the Washington Post and our daughter-in-law is getting a doctorate and she's busy getting, doing all that work. And so it was, it was me that wasn't the normal kind of busy planning the season. I, I kept re wanting to do that if there was any time to with two little, little teeny kids running around, but, and trying to figure out what, what our season could look like next year without mm -hmm. being able to rehearse in person. Yes. And I was in denial. So I was, I was trying to problem solve because there's nothing that I can't solve. Usually there's, you know, we will figure out a way. And there were little projects that started emerging and one was particularly exciting. And I was, I was starting to feel like myself again. And then it became apparent that even that project, at the end of October had to go down the wayside and everything had to be left to even more esoteric creativeness, like um, a truck came and played a concert from a truck. And we had a big carol sing way far distance across the street and things like that. But that's just, that's my music part. And I continue to do it, but it's not, it's not my daily purpose. And mm -hmm. that's, I think the hardest part of anybody um, no matter what age it is, but particularly at, towards your late sixties is what is your purpose? And how and, have you found new ways, evolving ways to find fulfillment in yourself, in your purpose as your direction, you know, was taken, you're feeling uh, that you are sort of adrift um, and your family came close, but what about Jody? Um, I, I found a few, a couple of new routines being, being very, very wonderful. One is coffee in bed. <laughs> Usually you just jump up to go to your exercise class on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or you go down and you, you just get going and your, in your, your notebooks are down by the kitchen table and your calendar and your to-do lists. And you're just like really on a roll And this time we alternate and one of us gets up and takes the dog out, feeds the dog, brings the coffee up and we sit in bed and, and I, I suppose read a lot. And it's been a, a very tumultuous year politically for our country. And I think we, we had certain things that we just had to touch stone on, a couple of people that wrote things every day that we still read. And, the best part were the birds and we started putting bird feeders all around our bedroom um, and you could in back there you can maybe even see one but um, stuck to the window and right outside the window and birds would sing and eat and we could recognize which bird it was and I have to say I really admired the chickadee the best. Um, the chickadees are so brave they, and they like people and they're not afraid of people or our cat or anything they're just they're if everyone could be a chickadee during COVID, it would be a um, be a good way to be. It's just it's um, just making the best of life, and they're mm. they're wonderful. They're not at all timid, but they're not pushy either. They're just like, all right, I'm here, I'm eating, and if there's a cat behind the window, I'll get to know her. <laughs> so that was 
it was nature and um then i guess the other thing is that a lot more time to um think about family and generations and a lot of my thoughts have gone to her my mother's mother who died when she was one and my father's mother who lost her only daughter at age 15 um to like an earache that they didn't have penicillin for back then and I had just been channeling into these two grandmothers, Grace and Wahlberg, and um, looking at their pictures and wondering what it was like, walking through cemeteries, imagining all those people who never thought their life was temporal, and then of course it is, and feeling, you know, combination of grief and nostalgia. And mm. I think the word that kept coming to me the most is poignancy. Life mm. is so poignant and I think poignet means just a little prickle or a point or a thorn or a yes it's um it's not a bad thing but it's 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 not it's not um felicitous and and upbeat it pierces you in a in a good way in, um, in that vein is there someone you wish you could see right now that you can't see our dog pearl um she died this is her picture right here and she died a year ago. So we we're still grieving for Pearl. And if I ever could um, see anyone again, it would be my mother's father. I never met her mother because she died when my mother was one, but her father, Axel was a minister. And he he always used to go, I'll just say, and this is, he used to go to me and, and sit me on his lap and he'd go like this. And and it's it's he's Swedish, hundred percent Swedish, born in Sweden. And, um, you know those Swedes are pretty vain. I think they know they're a good looking bunch. And he used and he'd go he'd go like this to me, and he'd and he'd say, "Thank God for good health, good looks, and a good personality." <laughs> and I I used to think that that was just it's funny that that's a long 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 time ago. He didn't say it when I was older, but that he always would look at me and say those things. And you think about what that means, health is everything. And yeah. looks are not, but I think your radiance and energy can be thought of as good looks. It's not just putting on a nice necklace or a beautiful sweater. It's, it's your radiance more. And then um, personality is just how to deal with things. That's and a beautiful how to memory. Make the best, but it's, it's so unspiritual. Mm. <laughs> except for the thank god part it's just and but you think about it and you say yeah um and it doesn't talk about money right at all it doesn't that and you really learn especially during covid how how important it is to be able to live but how unimportant things are with Only everything here. that's changed and evolved and been taken from us and we found new connections what do you think is the best part of your life right now after 2020? I suppose the, um, the fact that I'm forced to live in, a, in an unstructured day. Um, the structure, the fact that I had to talk with you today, well, it's a structure <laughs> and I have to yes. remember it and get there and all that. And the fact that there's so much less of that um, mm. lets you paint your day in a way um, relax a little bit more into the fact that you don't really know what your purpose is, except for there's a reason for it. I think in some ways, this whole conflu, the whole matching of COVID and the climate and Black Lives Matter and, um, and our, our country and all that are, are all just telling you to sit back and grow yes. and learn mm -hmm. and open and grief for things that you that aren't true anymore um, mm -hmm. and grow even if you are older and learn and and things like holidays aren't quite the same anymore the way you think or myths yes. uh, and 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 find a new way to live in that world new way to be able to um, there might be new things to do mm -hmm. although I, I have to say I keep thinking what else can I do besides 
um, do my ministry through my music of sorts. Yeah. I don't think of it. It's not a God kind of ministry, but it's a, it's a connecting and creating, creating um, memories and people that will connect you forever. And there's so much hope in that process of creating and finding connection and, and at all odds, continuing with positivity. What, um, what memory do you think that will serve you best as you move forward into that new hope? Well, I don't, I, I, I don't think I, I'm a very good collector of memories. That's why I'm not a writer. I think I'm, I, I have a very good friend yeah. who's a writer and he is so good at, at, at harvesting memories and, and um, crystallizing them and putting them into words. And, and I, I find that hard. I feel the memories, I, but I don't, rem, I don't remember them. I write down every day um, something that I'm, that I'm grateful for. And I just write the word for, and then I say something like um, the birds outside my window. And then I say, um, good job. And then I write something that I, that I did that I could actually say was good, like dinner tasted good. It doesn't have to be like too much more or- The I, chickadees, I, coffee in bed. Right, just, yeah. you just did a, you just had an okay day and you're, and you're, you didn't get anything done. Discipline is so hard. Like, why can't I practice the piano for an hour every day? I threatened to do that. And if I had planned my sabbatical, I would have, that would mm. have been part of this written down thing that I would have done. But since this is unplanned, I've got to make the best of it and say, well, don't just do something because you have, you know, you just try to see what it's like not to do much. Yes. And, and let the ideas sprout. And so I, I was saying that the best, the best memory has to do with family. Um, and I think the one that would, it's hard to talk about because it was so joyful that you cry at joy now, you know, joy is so brings you right to your knees. But um, we were swimming at a lake nearby. Um, our kids from Wolfboro came over, Crystal and not my son, but his wife and two kids, age eight and six, eight, eight and five. And the five-year-old is having some some going through some developmental sensory problems. He's, he can get a little bit moody or temperamental, has trouble transitioning. Um, and they're, they're trying to find out the root of what it all is and um, can be challenging, you know? And, and so we were, there's a dock you can swim out to a float and we were all in the other water wings and wasn't, he's not a swimmer yet. And he tried to, he got out there with help and a, and then got to the dock and it was so hard for him physically to get up onto the dock and it was huge that he just couldn't it was it, it, it was there was a lot of drama crying you know wailing na gnashing of teeth and and then but we just kept at it and then he got there and there he was at the top of the dock and his mom is is very um focused on him and really good steady strong mother but um, serious a lot but he got up there and his he lounged back and his his he was just so proud of himself and so relieved and then his mom just proceeded to do about seven dives from the dock imitating saying this is the grandpa dive and this is the cannonball dive and there was just it was like this beautiful release where Luke was so happy and that mom was so happy and we were all just out on the dock on a beautiful summer day and we'd seen him conquer a big fear and yes I think that was beautiful it was a could have happened without COVID but it was it was heightened by how how um, unfettered the joy was and spread to everyone and I would say that is one of my nicest memories and I think about him all the time because we can't see them except in the driveway because my dad my husband my sorry my my son is a dentist and very um careful about covid and all that so um that was that was a good thing I'm trying to think of what else we're getting some of the I, I keep thinking things will sprout out of all this Thanks. quietness and 
lack of disciplined and the resiliency is there the resiliency in all of us just like your grandson mm -hmm. to face the challenge again and again and then ah mm -hmm. uh, i did it i got up there yeah. yeah and then then that same day we went out into the woods and we were going out to the point which is across the pond a nice walk and there's a place that sometimes you can see a nice big snake big huge snake and and I said, you know, you know, we might let's go to the place where there's a snake. They'd never seen the snake. And we'll see if he's there because it's towards the end of the day. And there wasn't just one snake. There were three huge coiled snakes right on the and it was like magic. And snakes weren't scary. They were just like just so beautiful and, and uns, unsus, un, unsuspected that they would all be there. And then we proceeded to gather all these special little nuggets on the way home in nature. And it was, it was a beautiful day combining nature. And in some ways I like to call witchcraft that I, I sort of summoned the snakes. They, they didn't just do one, like three of them came to sort of put a cap onto Luke's swim and all that. And it was, a, it was, it was beautiful. Couldn't ask for anything nicer. And that was a, maybe one of the best days ever. Well, as we as we close our time together, I just want to thank you for sharing that spark of magic with us, the beauty of the unexpected moments and the ups and downs and uh, just the, the spark of hope that that can give us. Thank right. you so much for sharing your story. You're so welcome. Thank you for asking me to. I'm, I'm very honored you would ask me and, and I um, I hope it all works out well. Yeah.